Hi, everyone. Pastor Galen, lead pastor at Shine Hills Church. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope that these podcasts will be a real encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. You can also connect with Shine Hills at shinehills.org. Hope you enjoy the program. We are across the street and around the world. Cheyenne Hills. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast today. And thank you so much for joining us. Nathan, thank you so much for being here. Be here. It's good to have you here, man. And on a beautiful day. This is like... We haven't had a beautiful day in Cheyenne if, like this for a yeah. while. It's felt like the frozen chosen for sure the last... <laughs> no kidding. Uh, it's been cold. It's been really yeah. cold. I mean, some days actually look nice. You walk out and you just get hit by that cold blast. Mm -hmm. You know, I just found out, this is random, but I just found out that the, you know, the, the sitcom, you know, last 30 minutes sitcom right. actually has 22 minutes of content and eight minutes of commercial. Okay. And, and we have it... Somehow we picked the number twenty-two, as we're trying to hit twenty-two minutes and not go beyond that because that's that's the attention span of most uh, of people. Apparently, the TV. Are you going to start introducing commercials now? Well, no, well, maybe we should. We're, oh no, we're going to start. <laughs> there we go. We're going to introduce a book. There we go. Bit, that's good. Uh, Lutzer's book. But but um, I just thought it was kind of funny that they, our producer was just telling us that you know that's twenty-two minutes is the optimum time. It's like wow, there's some science behind nice. this, and we randomly picked that number. Oh, about twenty-two. So minutes. it wasn't science for you. No, you it just was not. Stumbled it's onto random. Truth. Yes, exactly. Oh. It was a every once in a while a blind school squirrel will find a nut, <laughs> and that's how that went. That's good stuff. That's good. So I don't care if you're lucky or good. It's just this. That's how long people can handle. So now they only have eighteen more minutes of attention span. So we've got to get into. Oh, it. Wow. And this time we are. Are going to get into Lutzer in his book. Oh yes, we've been talking we, about it for three episodes. We've around it for three episodes. Mm -hmm. It's my fault. I have not <laughs> drilled down. <clears throat> his book is uh, called "We Will Not Be Silenced." Uh, Irwin W. Lutzer. Mm. Uh, here's a here's a little clip from De Dr. David David Jeremiah. I suppose you know him too. Well, I don't know him. You haven't met him. I haven't met him. I, I haven't want either. To. I would. And, and where's his? He's a pastor of a church in, in San Diego, a very large one, Shadow Diego. Mountain. Uh, Bible Church. Yeah, I, I've I listened to you know his in time his eschatology is is he's Wonderful. a great guy to listen to. And Truly, he's a one to. Is he a Dallas guy by chance? Do you know where's I, seminary? I don't know. Uh, he his it matches perfectly what I cut right. my teeth on, so I didn't right. know if he was. I should know this, and I, I apologize. Well, one doesn't have to be a Dallas guy to hold to biblical <laughs> truth, right? <laughs> no, no, that's true. <laughs> but when you hear the eschatology right. of a guy, you go, oh, that sounds a whole lot, and, and not everybody. I mean, there's a few, yeah. Biola, and, and oh, there's a lot more that do right. that. But anyway, but so anyway, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah says, if I could, I would put this book into the hands of every Christian mm -hmm. in America. That's a strong endorsement from a from a very highly. Having read part of it, I get it too. Okay, it's powerful. Where yeah. would you do you want to start somewhere in this book? Is there something you you liked? There it? was a quote uh, partway through, and I appreciated it so much. But uh, uh, Doctor uh, Lutzer uh, jumps into the fact, he, and this is partway through the book, but he says. Uh, let me be clear. I am opposed to any form of judgmental tr Christianity that holds to truth without compassion and righteousness without humility. Hmm. I'm opposed to a form of Christianity that judges without listening and sees the faults of others without seeing our own. Yeah. But I see much of contemporary Christianity submitting to the culture in many areas of life, oh. especially in matters of sexuality. The only way to make Christianity appealing, we are told is to move the markers, to be more inclusive, more affirming. I fear we are allowing culture to inform our thinking and even raise our children, and we're no longer just submissive to the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. Right. We mentioned that in our last podcast. Yeah. We think we must accept or acquiesce to culture in order to redeem it. Yeah. And so he's really getting wow. to the heart of the matter. That's powerful. Yeah, it really there is. is this this pull on the Christian within the church, Yeah. and we are told that we are not loving unless we, as he says, and I think says well, acquiesce, acquiesce yep. to the culture. Well, and, and the pull to do that, I mean, even the, the shaming or I'm not sure if, it, if it's shaming or if it's like, uh, the, uh, you, you're just, you're just, uh, I don't know. You're almost disqualified from the conversation if you hold, hold a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes a lot of Hootspah to to actually engage and say and speak truth in love without getting riled up. Right, and uh, it's yeah. it's not for the faint heart. I can see why people just like, well, I'm just going to avoid it. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to believe it all, but I can't take it beyond right. that. 
Um, and I would say, you know, pastors the same way. We we can come and speak this truth, but can we get it out to that front line? It's like we talked about last time. You know, uh, Dr. Lutzer actually phrases what you've just said. Uh, he, he puts it in a, in a very simple phrase. He says, in a time of universal deception, yeah. telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Oh, wow. And That's it is really true. That is, it is scary Just to stand that. up for something that is true yeah. when you're living in a world where almost everyone is uh, lunging toward a universal deception. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've had to come to, and um, it, it really it kind of gets down to, you know, you always hear this in seminary is you got to decide which hill you're going to die on, right? Mm-hmm, right? And so what's your your hill you're going to die on? What's your topic that you would say, okay, if they ever approach this topic, I'm going to die on this hill. And I, I suppose everybody has right. that hill. Um, you know, certainly if, you know, if, if, if you're going to change the gospel or if, if, a, if a church, is, you know, you'd say, okay, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. I got to, I got to part from that because that's not the gospel. This is not the, the biblical gospel they've added in social gospel, whatever it is. Right. Um, so that would be certainly a hill. If you start saying, Hey, I don't, I don't believe the Bible's true anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a good reference book, but it's not truth. Um, I would, I would be willing, I'd have to die on that hill and say, right. no, I'm going to go with God's word and not your relative truth. And right. Uh, so there's some some of those kinds of things that um, you know, and of course the deity of Christ, um, the virgin birth, death, burial, and resurrection. Those are things. It's like, well, if you don't have those basics, um, then it, you know you're you're going to miss you're going to miss the gospel, right? right? But um, but when it comes to social issues, those are those are a little bit. We didn't talk about that in se- seminary. Right. You know, what are those social issues that mm-hmm. we, that we, should we die on those hills? Mm-hmm. You know, and we talked about one last, last week that I, that's affecting our kids. And I, and I've been thinking, well, do I, do I fear God more than I fear man? Do I fear God? You know, God says, you know, if you allow these little ones to be deceived, you know, there's bad consequences. Right. And it's like, uh, do I fear God or do I fear man's pushback on that? And I think those are the, the battles, at least that's what where my mind goes to, right. as when you get to those front line kind of battles, and what would push you to that front line. Right. I think you're the reason why it wasn't discussed so much in seminary, even as I was going through, um, is because the world we live in now was not even the world of 2015. That's so true. That is so true. So truth <clears throat> has remained yeah. truth all along. Yeah. But there are current claims uh, on the table today that. Uh, not only defy reality and and just the natural senses communities common the sense common sense right right it it's something that uh, it, there was never a felt need to actually address those things in a in a seminary or Bible college or college in general yeah. because it's so far out of bounds from what is commonly considered universal knowledge right and so when you look at that though God has created us for this moment. No Christian is on earth right now by accident. Mm. God knew the era into which we would be born. That's a really good reminder. And so Dr. Lutzer, he Because I keep saying, God, you should have picked a more, somebody tougher, stronger, more intelligent, because, you know, these are these are hard things, right? Right, right. But that's a really good reminder. He he yeah. put us in places, and, and I and I do believe he's mm. he has, you know, it wasn't my... Uh, ascending the ladder. It was right. God, God, I've got a story. It's like, I know God put yeah. me where I was supposed to be. And, uh, in, even in the pastorate. Mm-hmm. And so that's a good reminder. Thank well, you for that. We all have a, uh, every Christian that has ever uh, trusted Christ as a savior over the last 2000 years has had a cross to bear. Yeah. God commands us to take up our cross and that's follow true. him. That's so true. there's a cross to bear. And God knew the cross that we would need to bear, that we would be called to bear. Okay. The problem is, and I've done the same thing, I've wondered before, would it have been easier to live in this era or another era? Especially yeah. if you love history, it's fun. It, your mind can start taking those paths. Yeah. Dr. Lutzer addressed that by quoting a poet, I think a Russian poet. Hmm. But and, and let me just read it to you. Vasily Zuka, uh, Zukovsky wrote, We all have crosses to bear. And we're constantly trying on different ones for a better fit. <laughs> oh man, I I wish that you would have warned me about that one a little bit before you just read it. <laughs> it hurt. It felt the same way to me when I first read it because you're right. I, like Lord, I don't want this cross. I want a different cross. Right, right. Oh my gosh. But so but true. you look at that and you realize I don't care if you're in Russia or wherever this oh, man is gosh. from. Yeah. We all have those ideas, but we have to come back to that point. 
God has us here yeah. for a specific reason in this very moment. That's a mic drop right there. We should just end this thing. But we got we got to go twenty two minutes because you know we got that right much right. We, we already said we we're going to go that far. <laughs> that was, that's really good though. How many times have we? I mean, it's such yeah. an applicational right. thing. I said, Lord, I you know I want a different cross. I want right. a different era. I want a different problem. And right. It's like no, this this is the one we're wired for. And it's good to remember that when it gets difficult. And that's where that old statement, uh, and I don't know where it originated, but that uh, Christianity without courage is cultural atheism. It is well, easy. slow down. Yes, sir. Christianity without courage is cultural atheism. Yes, wow, sir. That's really good. Well, it is easier to live out your faith yeah. in the four walls of your home, yeah. in the four walls of your church. No doubt. But when you are unapologetically and lovingly Christian, when you go to work, when you drive to work, yeah. when you go into the store and you run into someone who doesn't like you, or or you are called to go in and, and uh, talk to the teacher uh, in in a in a public school about something that is clearly contrary to the truth, uh, not only of God and the gospel, but also of natural natural law and science. Yeah. When you're called into those moments, if you don't actually live out your Christian faith in those moments, what you're living out is cultural atheism. Wow. And that is a sobering thought. Wow. And that's why we stay engaged. Yeah, that's really good. Great reminder. That's two convicting things really back to back. So I, I, you're done. You're, oh, you're, okay. That's too All much. Right. You take over, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That's, that's really good. But yeah. that's, no, but seriously, this, this book has mm -hmm. brought up a lot of things yes, um, that have... I wanted to read one little uh, clip that I thought was good because one of the things that uh, in our day is this climate change, global warming, climate mm -hmm. change. And, and basically... And I'm not going to sit here and argue those things, but what what I what I really refuse to believe is that man is going to end the world, right? Because the Bible says, you know, when, it, when you read the Bible, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and when He does that, that's at the end of the millennium, right? And that's basically however long you think this is going to last. It's going to last a thousand years longer than that, and right. God's going to create a new heaven and right. a new earth according to Him. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know if I have to go out and convince everybody of that, but I. I don't. I don't worry about the. Uh, although I got to. I got to put disclaimers. I believe in stewardship. I believe in being a good. You know, when I was going to, I've got my animal science degree. That animal science degree used to be called animal husbandry, mm -hmm. how to treat animals and how to take care of your. The, the the range and manage right. the range and all those things. I mean, I we love care. that old term. There's so much. It involved. is a good. It is yeah. a good term, and uh, we probably shouldn't have changed it. Right. But I've always cared about the land and about the climate, and, or not the climate, the the, the land and and stewardship of the land and all mm -hmm. those things, and and keeping it clean. You know right. that whole cleanup era back in the '70s. I was I was all about that too, mm -hmm. and so I I care about all these things, but I don't believe that man has the power. To destroy the earth. Agreed. That's basically what I Anthropogenic I believe. global warming. You're right. You're repudiating that idea. Yeah, exactly. So so he's speaking to to this, and he basically says that he said, years ago I read the Humanist Manifesto, mm. but until recently had forgotten that it was Marxist globalist document. The original version was written in 1933, but here I quote from the second version, 1973, edited by Edwin H. Wilson and Paul Kurds. I'm trying to say his name not wrong, Kurtz. Um, in many regard Kurtz as the father of secular humanism. Mm -hmm. All right. As you might expect, the document denies supernaturalism in all its forms, promises of immortal salvation, or fear of eternal damnation are illusionary and harmful. The human species is, here's a quote again, is an uh, emergence from natural evolutionary forces, end quote. And there is no credible evidence that life survives the body, death of the body. <clears throat> the universe is considered to be self-existent. So here's a quote from the Humanist Manifesto. Uh, it strongly advocates globalism. So here's not necessarily a, um, oh, wow. a global, you know, a, um, climate change kind of topic, but it's 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 talking about this globalism that I think we're dealing with today. We deplore the division of humankind on nationalistic grounds. We have reached a turning point in the human history where the best option is to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to move toward building a world community. 
Thus, we look to development of a social, or to, to, of a system of world law and world order based upon transnational federal government. And so, so this is kind wow. of a, a, brings about a fundamental question that I have. So we see a lot of the things, I do, I'll just speak for myself. I see a lot of the things that we studied in seminary that will be, you know, under the Antichrist, there'll be one world government, there'll be one world religion. Mm-hmm. That assumes a one-world, right. um, uh, international, transnational kind of existence, and it also assumes a, a one-world currency. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, I don't know how you have a one-world government without a one-world cur- exactly. currency. So it assumes a lot of those kinds of things as well. The Bible teaches that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think I see a lot of things that are that make me think that wow, we are on that track, right. and it's and it's basically a humanist manifesto. Uh, written into their manifesto, uh, they they advocate globalism, and so that's the, so you see this going down the track. And so one of the questions I've had is, what does it look like? We talked about this some already, but what does it look like to do? We go out and stand in front of that train and say, hey, don't stop globalism. You know, you're going down the wrong track. You're gonna that train. The Bible says that train where it's going to go. Right. And so are we supposed to go stand in front of it? Or so, so how, I know we're supposed to go to the front lines. Um, can you make any sense of the question I'm trying to form here? What are we supposed to do as Christians is what right. I'm trying to ask. That's great. And there's so much to unpack there, yeah. even in the statement. So it's very interesting. The, the 1933 Humanist Manifesto, by the way, one of its signers, uh, Thomas Dewey, was also the founder of the National Education Association. Oh, wow. And that humanism uh, was held up uh, as something that was a very positive thing, but really it drove us toward the spirit of the age. And note where in the nineteen in the second version of that... 1973, it's... 1973. It makes the statement that the earth, and I've never read that before, but this is good, but note this. It says that the earth is self-existent. Yeah. There's only one self-existent one. That is a theological statement. Wow. So even in the statement oh. of this humanist perspective, they're making theological statements. Like a, like the earth is some kind of deity, Mother Earth kind of thing. Precisely. Is that what you're saying? It, exactly. Wow. And it's, it goes back to the old statement from, I think it's G.K. Chesterton, who made the statement, when people cease to believe in God, it is not that they believe in nothing, they'll believe in almost anything. Yes. And that is what, when you read that, I thought of Chesterton because it is so rich with theological claims being wow. made. Yeah. No and doubt. so you, you, you look at those statements and realize that as a pastor in, uh, just outside of D.C., Jonathan Lehman makes the statement that we are on the battlefield, battleground of the gods that every culture is the battleground of the gods. There is the God of this age, yeah. and then there is the God of eternity and all of heaven. Right. And so you look at that. Every Christian has to recognize, first and foremost, that we are on a battleground. And the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesian church, tells us that. It's true. So then the thing is, as we get our armor on, do, do we put our armor on because we're simply here to exist, to do as we talked about in the last podcast, where we... Uh, stand on top of our ivory towers and throw rocks over on occasion, right. or are we supposed to be on the ground standing for truth? Right. The question that you come... So all of that needs to be said to come back around to where you led that question. And it was really, it was really a good question. What does it mean then mm-hmm. to stand as a Christian right. in this age? And so you look at that. Um, in, the, in the time of the Reformation, many of our found, uh, the, the fathers of the Reformation were discussing that thing. That, that exactly. Hmm. Many came to the wrong conclusion that, uh, that the church and state were inseparable. Um, that, that isn't at all true. Uh, there is a tradition for those of us who are of English descent um, that believes in a separation of church and state, but recognizing that the church must speak into the state. Right. And so we have to hold truth. We are the That's ones true. that actually hold up the signpost that says, this is true, this is the way that we ought to walk in, therefore right. walk in it. Right. And so we have to engage, and we cannot retreat into our homes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, and I've told you this before personally, maybe I've told you on this podcast too, but that I so appreciate what, what you, your role um, as a theologically trained person, been a pastor, also been in the legislature eight years, I think, mm-hmm. and six. and now six years, and now you know, now kind of in this family policy alliance is the mm-hmm. kind of a conduit between both, and you have helped a lot of us, myself included, to be 
at least a pathway into what it looks like to get to that front lines. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, it's one thing to say that I want to go to the front lines. It's another one to to be able to find a pathway and and even the right wording and the where to where to put the pressure. Right. And I I really appreciate how you've you've done that. I want to finish this this little yeah. paragraph here because it talks about connecting to this is co- cooperation about climate change. The planet Earth must be considered as a single ecosystem. Mm-hmm. It is a it is the moral obligation of the developed nations to provide massive technological, agricultural, medical economic assistance to the developing portion of the globe. So, so all this humanist manifesto in this globalist, you know, thing that's really been, uh, been, been promoted since the the 1930s. Um, well, God wrote about it, you know, long, you know, 2000 years ago That's right. and predict projected that this was going to happen. But at the same time, I think what you've, you've articulated is that that we need to still, I mean, forever, the church has got to speak truth, hold the signpost That's up right. and say, so regardless, and, and yes, we want to speak salvation, no question about that. Mm-hmm. And we want people to come f- to faith in Christ. But I do think we need to speak truth to our culture right. in a way that is uh, at the best we can. I mean, it's still, I, I mean, I, I think we can speak it perfectly and it's still going to come across probably as hate speech or who knows what, or as uncaring and be misconstrued. But, uh, I I guess my conclusion is that I, that I, I think we're supposed to try. Amen. Well, part of it is recognizing that every Christian stands at the crossroads of faith and culture. Yeah. And there are many Christians throughout the ages who have done it very, very poorly. Paul even excoriates, uh, one church in Corinth who had bowed uh, to the culture of his day. Uh, the Apostle John references one in the, at the church of Laodicea. Right, um, that's true. That had bowed to the culture Not in his day. Not hot or cold. Right, that's right. exactly. Wow. And so th- this is part of what it means to be Christian. Yeah. But know this, that we stand on that, that intersection, but we also have very clear signposts. And it was the very first sermon I ever heard you preach. And it was taken from Hebrews. And but but as you pointed out, that Christ ran the race set before him, looking to Jesus, the that that we ought to run, looking unto Jesus, uh, the author and finisher of his of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Yeah, he knew there was a cross in his he lane, and cross. he kept running. And he ran. That's so the signposts reminder, are yeah. clear for us in our lane. Yeah. And so wherever that intersection is, yeah. we have a clear path. Wow. Well, our, we're up. We're our twenty-two minutes are up. So we so people's attention spans probably oh, fading yes. right now. We have eight minutes you, of commercials ran, left. <laughs> that's true. We got commercials. <laughs> Hang in there for all the commercials. No, seriously, Nathan. Thank you. Seriously, Amen. there's a there's a ton of content in this podcast, and I hope that we can just apply just a little bit of it. And I will know. I will tell you that I know for sure that if you're going to apply any of the things that we've talked about today, and myself included, it's going to be because. It's going to take us to be strong and very courageous. God bless you all. Thanks.